Hey guys, Tyler here. The Quarians are a nomadic humanoid species from the Mass Effect game series. Known for their technological prowess, the Quarians created a synthetic race called the Geth in the mid to late 19th century. Originally built to serve as an efficient source of manual labor, the Geth gradually gained sentience and eventually conquered the Quarian homeworld, Rannoch, forcing their creators and former masters off-world. Since then, for centuries, the Quarians have roamed the galaxy on the so-called Migrant Fleet. Quarians are distinguished by their weak immune systems, forcing them to wear environmental suits throughout their lifetimes, and by their three-fingered hands and lower legs that are bowed backwards. Indeed, the Quarians are one of the most biologically unique humanoid aliens in Mass Effect. In this video, I'd like to examine the biology, history, and culture of the Quarians and compare them to our expectations about aliens in real life. Let's get started. Quarians are generally shorter than humans on average and of slighter build. Like humans and Asari, they have an endoskeleton, lips, and tear ducts, an important distinction in a galaxy with so many varied life forms. Quarians can see into the ultraviolet end of the light spectrum, and the HUDs on their suits display information in those wavelengths. While we never see the side of a Quarian's head, it's said that their ears differ noticeably from humans. Various depictions of unmasked Quarians including official concept art by associate art director Matt Rhodes, show them with purple-tinted skin and a pattern of markings on their face, as well as purple-colored irises. Previously, Rhodes had envisioned the Quarians as having pale skin, cat-like eyes, and no hair. For Tally's final in-game appearance, though, she has white irises and a Caucasian complexion with two brown marks above her brow ridge. Quarian sexual dimorphism is comparable to that of humans. While some Mass Effect comics have depicted Quarian blood as purple, in the games, it is red when oxygenated. And furthermore, while many have observed that Quarian's knees bend backwards compared to Asari and humans, as you can see on this Talizora body pillow that I ordered just for this video from the Bioware store, not a sponsor, this is actually a misconception. Generally, life forms on Earth that appear to have backwards facing knees, like birds, actually don't. Their knees bend forwards, but their stature is what's called digitigrade rather than plantigrade. That is, they walk on their toes rather than their heels. What's perceived as a backwards facing shin bone is actually the animal's foot. In any event, such a trait may have allowed Corian's ancestors to run faster. Much like the three digits on each of their hands, Corians also have three toes on each foot, though male Quarians apparently lack a third toe. God, oh Lord. In humans, the phenomenon of having three fingers on one's hand is called ectrodactyly and is naturally considered a congenital disorder that results from a developmental mutation. But for an alien species, such a trait being the norm would simply be a quirk of evolution, one with broader implications than you might suspect. On Earth, the evolution of five digits in tetrapods, four-limbed vertebrate animals, including us, has long been a fascinating and controversial area of paleontology. A 2008 reconstruction of Pandarichthys, a coastal fish that lived during the Devonian period 385 million years ago, indicates that these animals already had many homologous or similar bones in their forelimbs that are still present in modern tech Tetrapods. For instance, they had five radial fin bones that resembled rudimentary fingers, but Tiktaalik, often considered a missing link between fish and amphibians, had stubby leg-like limbs and lacked Pandarichthus's radial fin bones. Either way, what we do know is that all land vertebrates, and animals descended from land vertebrates like dolphins and whales, have five distal bones called phalanges in their forelimbs, an arrangement called pentadactyly. What's unclear is whether such structures evolved once 
or evolved convergently multiple times. In any event, while evolving to only have three fingers might seem like a limitation, on the contrary, three-fingered alien species could theoretically retain most of the dexterity that we have. Thus, the Quarians' reduced digits would act as a biological cost-saving measure, as their bodies would have to provide energy to fewer muscles. And of course, the Geth also have three fingers on each hand, and they can blow you to oblivion just as well as any five-fingered alien could. Like Turians, Quarian's biochemistry is based on dextroamino acids and levo sugars rather than the levo amino acids and dextro sugars of humans and Asari, a phenomenon called chirality. Many scientists believe that the chirality of Earth life is purely the result of random chance, meaning if carbon-based life exists elsewhere in the universe, it could have the opposite chirality. Though much like the distribution of matter and antimatter, levo amino acids could still be dominant. One consequence of this alternative biochemistry is that dextroproteins would taste sweet, in contrast to the flavor of earth meats. But biomolecules of the opposite chirality would be incompatible with typical stereochemistry. In Mass Effect, one way this manifests is Turians and Quarians being unable to digest food from levoprotein biospheres. At best, such food is inedible to them, though in the worst cases it can be poisonous and trigger a dangerous, sometimes lethal, allergic reaction. All Quarians who embark on a pilgrimage are given a refined edible paste, though those who wish to sample alien cuisine can eat specially purified Turian food. The typical Quarian diet is vegan, though, purely out of practical concerns, as the amount of water required to sustain livestock is much higher than the amount required to cultivate crops. Beyond just their digestive system, though, as I mentioned earlier, there's also the matter of the Quarian immune system. Quarians have always had weak immune systems, as pathogenic microbes were rare in Rannoch's biosphere. What few viruses and other microbes were native to the planet were at least partially beneficial to the Quarians, much like our gut bacteria. Centuries of living in sterile environments like the migrant fleet have caused Quarians' immune systems to further atrophy. Quarians are thus given various vaccinations and immunizations to help ward off disease. Even with the medical precautions Quarians take to stay healthy, though, most are reluctant to remove their highly sophisticated environmental suits without good reason. These suits can be compartmentalized to deal with wear and tear or other breaches and prevent the spread of contaminants, much like a ship sealing off bulkheads after a hull breach. Quarians also possess extensive cybernetic augmentations throughout their bodies. They can, however, sip alcohol through an emergency induction port. That's a straw, Tally. Emergency induction port. Quarians live roughly as long as humans, but if even one infection breaches into their suit, their lifespans can be reduced by years. If a Quarian wishes to remove their suit, say for, you know, for sex, or giving birth, they must take antibiotics herbal supplements, and immuno boosters to do so safely. Even then, there are always inherent risks, making physical acts of affection, even purely for reproduction, difficult for Quarians. The most intimate thing two Quarians can do is link up their suit environments, but doing so always guarantees that a Quarian will get sick, although they can usually adapt over time. The Quarian's immunodeficient physiology, combined with their status as a marginalized people in galactic politics, has been widely discussed by commentators over the years. Some have even noted similarities between the Quarians, forced to wear masks and be hypervigilant of potential infection risks, and the experiences of people in lockdowns 
during the COVID-19 pandemic. The effects the Koreans' lifestyle has on their social bonding has also been widely examined, particularly in the context of disability representation in Mass Effect. Indeed, the Koreans' community dynamics, naturally influenced by their condition, raise lots of interesting questions about how humans would survive in a world further plagued by disease, economic strife, and social isolation. Before we examine the Koreans' history and culture, it's important to take a look at their homeworld. Rannoch is arid by Earth standards as it formed closer to its star and is covered in slightly less ocean. Rannoch's average surface temperature is listed at 48 degrees Celsius, or 118 degrees Fahrenheit. Jeez. The K-type orange star that Rannoch orbits is called Tikkun. It's about 90% the mass of Sol, but only half as luminous. So it's no surprise that Rannoch orbits its star at 72% the distance Earth orbits the Sun. Rannoch's day length is 32.3 hours long, which is to be expected for a planet that orbits closer to its star. Indeed, planets orbiting even smaller M-class red dwarfs are prone to tidal locking, meaning their rotational periods and revolutions are equivalent, or in other words, their day is the same as their year. This is the case, for example, with Earth's moon, which is 238,000 miles, or 383,000 kilometers away. Rannoch's atmospheric pressure is 93% Earth's, its surface gravity is 0.89 g, and it's orbited by a single moon. Photosynthetic life on Rannoch is concentrated along rivers and in oceans, with large expanses in between covered by deserts. Plant life on Rannoch exhibits a familiar green color, though Tikkun's starlight, skewing more towards the red portion of the spectrum, could mean that Corian skin pigments reflect blue light. Combined with their red blood, this could explain the complexion of purple-skinned Corians, who we do know exist thanks to Mass Effect 3's extended cut. According to Tally and the Codex, Rannoch has no insect life, meaning that plants must rely on other animals for propagation. This symbiosis is given as a reason for the Corian's weak immune systems, because remember, no diseases, which has in turn made colonization of other planets difficult after their exile. Combined with the further damaging effects of living in artificial environments, for many Corians, reclaiming their homeworld is both a cultural and physiological necessity. While Corian history reveals a lot about their society and culture, most of what we know about it is associated with the Geth Uprising, which I plan to cover in another video. We do learn a lot about Corian's cultural practices from our interactions with Tally and the Migrant Fleet, and I do want to highlight some of those facts. Corian's top priority is the survival and sustainability of the Migrant Fleet, with most of their laws and customs revolving around that goal. Korean law prohibits couples from having more than one child, so the fleet can maintain zero population growth and avoid straining their already limited resources, though this rule is temporarily lifted if the population begins to shrink. Families are thus very small and close-knit. Conditions aboard most Korean ships are extremely cramped, with family members often sharing a small living space in close proximity to other families' quarters. Because every Korean depends on their crewmates to survive, the species is more community-minded than more individualistic species like the Krogan. Their economy is moneyless and subsistence-based, with unused items traded in a quasi-marketplace to free up space. Food and medicine are handled more strictly, with incoming and outgoing shipments tracked carefully, and distribution highly regimented. The Corians also obtain resources from strip mining asteroids and selling items to other planets. Young Corians are required to undertake a pilgrimage away from the fleet to become a full adult. Their departure is a major event, 
with the entire crew assembling to see them off. Corians are given many gifts to aid them on their journey, as well as immuno boosters and survival advice. A Corian cannot return to the flotilla until they have found something of value to bring back, whether it is information, money, or supplies. Even though I did just get through saying that their economy is moneyless. Much like the Federation in Star Trek, this phrase seems to be rather fluid. Corians do not return to their birth ship, instead joining a new ship to maintain genetic diversity. The Corian presents their new captain with a gift that is rarely turned down. In centuries past, Corians practiced a form of ancestor worship, and respect for ancestors is still prevalent in Corian society. The Corians have a religious exclamation, Kila, and a phrase, Kila Salai, that is said in the same vein as Peace Be With You. Corian names are divided into four parts. The Corian's given name and the name of their clan separated by an apostrophe, their title and the name of their vessel. Nar means child of, referring to the ship on which a Corian was born, while Vas means crew of, adopted after a Corian has completed their pilgrimage and joined a ship. For example, Tali was born Tali Zora Naraya. Then, after she completed her pilgrimage and joined the crew of the Nima, she became Tali Zora Vas Nima. Later, her name is changed again to Tali Zora Vas Normandy. The roughly 17 million Corians on the migrant fleet are technically governed under martial law, but they do have representative bodies such as the Admiralty Board and the democratically elected Conclave. Ship captains and onboard civilian councils also handle most in-house matters. The Corian Navy patrols vigilantly to protect civilian ships, which are also heavily armed, making the fleet an unpopular target for pirates. Are. Many species look down on the Corians, the foremost reason for which is that they're blamed for unleashing the Geth on the galaxy. Members of the fleet are often viewed as beggars and thieves, with Tally revealing that when she first arrived on the Citadel, she was interrogated by CSEC before being allowed to roam freely. Some corporations even hire Corian temp workers if the fleet is nearby, much to the annoyance of local workers a parallel to the scorn migrant workers often face in real life. Lacking an official voice in galactic politics, the Corians are thus rather insular, caring only about the survival of the migrant fleet. Between all of the facts that we have discussed today, it should be clear why the Corians are a fan favorite. They're certainly my favorite alien species in Mass Effect, one reason I've been looking forward to covering them for so long. So if you were a captain aboard an Alliance ship, would you recruit a Corian to serve under you? Let me know down below. With that, thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up down below and don't forget to share it. That stuff really helps me out. If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to do that as well so you won't miss future uploads and click the bell icon to receive all notifications. If you want to support my work even further, becoming a patron or a member is a great way to do so. Links to those as well as my social media and merch store are in the description where you can get a shirt like this one designed by my good friend Phobia. That's all I have for this week. Kila Salai. I should go.